This is a Geek Leader Podcast, and I'm your host, John Rauta. This show is all about helping us grow as leaders, become better technologists, and improve our lives both at work and at home. I hope you enjoy the show and learn a lot. Hello, world, and welcome to a Geek Leader Podcast. I'm your host, John Rauta. Today's sponsor is A2 Hosting. I've been using A2 Hosting solid state hosting solutions for our website at geekleader.com for many, many years now and absolutely love their support, their service, and all the features that you get. You get access to cPanel. You get all of the things that you can imagine for a great WordPress experience, including their A2 optimized WordPress, which does extra security checks, extra lockdown. It, you can lock down your editor uh, file so you can't edit anything inside there. You get alerts whenever there are file changes that are done. Um, you can also do automatic updates, backups, and more with A2 hosting. So highly recommend it. Go to a geekleader.com slash A2 to get more information and to sign up for their solid state turbocharged speed hosting today. Again, that's a geekleader.com slash A2. All right, Geek Leaders, today I'm honored to have Sangeeta Krishnan on the show. She is the author of Thriving in a Data World. She's a data expert. We're going to talk a lot about analytics, data. Uh, we're also getting into a little bit of team building and how to use data in your communications. So it's going to be a fun conversation. And uh, Sangeeta, welcome to the show. Thanks, John, for having me. Excited to have a chat with you. Yeah, so if you don't mind, tell the audience a little bit about your background and kind of how you got into data and what is it that you do with data today? Sure. Um, a short summary of who I am and why I like to work in data I would be like, uh, even from a young age, I really liked like statistics and math to be um, like in particular. Uh, so from there on, I did my master's in computer science as well. And then my initial career has been like um, software developer. So I have started off as a web developer. And from there on, I have held different uh, progressive roles, like whether it's product management and uh, uh, overseeing like a team, which does like software engineering, product management in, in that area. And also then gradually moving into the data space. For somebody who has a passion of numbers and um, data storytelling, it kind of gelled very well because the amount of data as such organizations are collecting in the recent years has gone up a lot. So my transition from more core software engineering, I moved more into overseeing data projects and that is what I currently work. And even in data, um, I've done everything in data, I would say, like whether it's data management, data governance, all elements in some shape or form in the different roles I have held. And also for different company sizes, like whether it's very small, Fortune 500, anything in between. So I have a good amount of exposure to the kind of problems uh, companies face depending on their size. Right. So because the challenges are different if, if they are a bigger organization versus somebody who is a stock. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like we, you know, I feel like as a leader today, when I'm looking at like, you know, tools that we've developed and build and, and even things we use like Microsoft 365, it all generates so much data that's out there that uh, I think most leaders and companies are not using today. Uh, yes. Um, one of the reasons is because, um, Sometimes there is like so much of volume of data we are generating and then it is that ROI concept, right? Like what mm -hmm. is the ROI I'm looking at? Although at one end, we, we don't have a scarcity of data. In, in nowadays, I definitely will not say there is a scarcity. Maybe there is a scarcity sometimes of quality data. Those are two different things, but the volume of data is just keep on growing. But at the same time, from for the leaders, it is more of like an opportunity, right? I mean, we cannot just use every data and try to make some sense out of it. So that is why the ROI definition of what is my use case and our use case driven is very important because otherwise I'm going to use my resources and funding in a wrong way of, and I won't see much value. There is no return of all the effort I put in. So that is where I believe the struggle is, where it is not like, um, sometimes it's like the quality is in question two. So mm -hmm. people lose trust before they even start. So hence for any company to really see like success in using data, a um, couple of things need to happen, um, which is something I cover in my book. Um, data literacy is one of the aspects which is important and data governance 
because then only there is trust with data, right? And also people are empowered to use the data as well. And um, a team structure of how efficient your operating model is for the team is of very important uh, uh, aspect also. Otherwise, the wrong players in the wrong place will not really work very well. So all these things kind of are needed. And that is, I believe, is the struggle why not so much of to the capability to the fullest is not being used. Yeah, absolutely. And when I when I think about data governance, that's one of the the things that you know I, I've struggled with with some of my positions before is making sure that all the data that we have is properly cataloged. That you know, for example, we have the proper metadata for the information and things are tagged properly. That uh, there's also permissions that are set correctly so that you know who has access to which piece of data and all with all the you know things that are going on now with privacy like GDPR and California Privacy Act that becomes exceedingly important. Where have you seen companies kind of uh, fall short in the data governance section? Um, a way that I would see is like automation aspect, right? Because uh, we are generating a lot of data, and for many people, when you ask people what is data governance for you. For most people, it feels like it's like a rule book, right? Okay, this is a set of rules. And many people have a perception of data governance as something, oh, how do, uh, I mean, how can I shut people from having access to? Actually, that is not a message data governance in any organization should show. Rather, data governance should be more of, um, like, uh, we know the mistakes which need to happen as a learning process, so there should be distinction between uh, some kind of mistakes which will get us fined versus some learning mistakes. So that uh, transparency needs to happen. And also one thing that one is the messaging of how you brand data governance in your organization. Um, the other one would be uh, automation because if everything in data governance has to be like a very manual uh, critical step that needs to be set out, a lot of manpower needed to do it, we cannot really, for the amount of volume of data that is generated, it is not feasible to do it. So looking into opportunities of what aspects of data governance could be automated is an area I think uh, people fall short of. So the two items I mentioned, one is the branding of data governance itself. It shouldn't be seen as something nobody wants to deal with and also uh, automation. Yeah, for sure. Um, so automation is kind of one of those things where yeah, some people kind of confuse automation and AI, and with all this, uh, you know, things that are coming out in the news and all the, all the stories about Chat GPT and the use of data there. Do you see uh, some higher risk when it comes to uh, the proper use of data uh, and automation when it comes to like integrating it with AI, or is that something that's you know further down the road? I mean, sometimes when people think of AI and all this kind of automation, it is like people sometimes feel like okay. I'll put it in like an autopilot kind of a mode and never have to worry about it. Actually, that's not how people should perceive aut automation to begin with, right? So automation still has to be overseen somehow, but there should be, you know, put human in the automation process too. So there are some aspects you don't want somebody sitting and doing it manually, but at the same time, you automate enough and try to validate that whatever you have automated even makes sense in the results of what you expected. So that is a miss sometimes. Um, if there is a human in the picture, I think there will be uh, clarity towards like, okay, I automated these steps. The result is what I'm looking at. And I also readjust, right? If that is not the result I'm looking for, you have an opportunity to readjust. So when we say automation, it's not like... Um, have it completely in autopilot and never have to even think about it. That's not how we should see automation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, and when it comes to like automation, what tools that are, are out there that people should be looking at or researching when it comes to like automating their, their data? Because, you know, we're, you, depending on what service you're in, you're getting, you know, lots of information. And in. like if we're making videos, we have all this metadata that we're attaching to the media and then, with other tools where we're, you know, generating a lot of log files of what people are doing with data and lots of analytics that, that we can go back and look at later. But what kind of automation tools are out there? Actually, um, there are a lot of, in the recent years, there has been a lot of cataloging tools. I'm not going to name some uh, tools, but uh, at the same time, 
there are like auto ML, um, no code ML, mm -hmm. those tools, even if you Google it, there are several tools in this space. Even for people who are not really like big hardcore coders, there is a lot out of the shelf uh, products available and cataloging tools. There are at least two, three big players in the space uh, who are very efficient because um, when it comes to data cataloging also, I mean, how much of the data you have, you cannot protect the data. You don't even know it existed, right? The data lineage aspect. So, um, so these are the tools people should start looking at. Um, and also how your visualization is set up because mm -hmm. there are some aspects where you can autom automation is just not for the governance board, right? I mean, if you're building a dashboard as an organization, pretty much every BI uh, tool in the space has matured in the last several years. There is self-service on top of pretty much every tool where all the big tools we are talking about, um, which is a, something people should take advantage of also because otherwise you're building reports all the time, right? So self-service in hand in hand with what you're building. So all of these are kind of automations I am thinking of. Operational automation and also like uh, self-service kind of automation because that will free up the time you are um, using to build something, right? To build something more, which cannot be automated that easily. So that is how I see it. Mm, yeah, for sure. Um, so how should leaders be using this data uh, when it comes to like communicating with their peers or, or how, in communication in general? Is it something that we need to be like massaging or changing or using visuals? Uh, what's your best practices? Um. A data storytelling, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. That is the area we hear, even if you read anything nowadays. Many people are talking about data storytelling. Um, I did dedicate a chapter for data visualization or data storytelling. Because when it comes to communication of data, I mean, how many times we all have sat in some presentation, a data presentation, where there is so much of data presented to us, and at the end of the day, it's like, Oh, you feel overwhelmed walking out of that because it is like the person who has done all this analysis, everything is on the on the PowerPoint or a PDF or however it is shared. So that is not a very right approach, right? So you should always start or anybody should always start with asking the question of who am I presenting for? And also the mode, like, I mean, whether it's going to be in person, all these things matter. And also to um, kind of bring it to a level of the audience, because that is normally not the starting point. Many times people think, I've done all this like 20 hours of research into finding what is what is what I want to share, or all this data I have collected, and I have to tell everything to the audience somehow, because that is all I collected, rather than picking and choosing this is one or two messages which is I feel are very actionable. That is what the user wants, the audience wants to hear. And if I share that, it will be more clear, crisp, and also um, something people will relate to. So there is a lot of things um, that needs to be put emphasis on, like a, even color schemes, right? Like certain color schemes make it more user-friendly, people pay more attention to, all of those things are important and that unfortunately doesn't happen. In my experience, most of the time when it is like sharing data presentations or like uh, sharing whatever the findings of data are, it sometimes feels like very overwhelming amount of information shared for an audience to stay focused. It doesn't feel like I mean, um, done more at a level of audience. And again, there are aspects where you will be sharing this data uh, information with a very technical audience. So the level of detail for a technical audience definitely will be much more. But when you are going to share with other kind of audience, business stakeholders or whoever it is, it has to be at a level where they appreciate and also there should be more so that they stay curious along the way. That That is what I would like to say. Mm. Yeah, no, I think I think uh, I think it's interesting when you, when you get into like color schemes and things that really do make a difference and and how to keep people curious. I remember hearing someone that were doing A/B testing. They found like different shades of green on like their you know confirm buttons would influence like the uh, <laughs> the amount of click throughs and things like that. And I just found you know that, that's so fascinating of how the, the human brain works when it comes to, to information and colors. 
Yeah, the colors, font, everything kind of makes a difference. And also, again, it depends whether you're a global organization or it's a small uh, startup or whatever, because if it's global, uh, one is like your brand colors, of course, but other aspects are like, you know, some colors are perceived differently in different cultures as well. So that is why I start with the question of who am I presenting to? That will really be very important because the size of your audience and all those things make a difference. And for a global audience, maybe you pick the colors which shouldn't have been picked. So yeah. there is a lot to it. Many times I've noticed like when we say, oh, let's put together a presentation of all the data analysis we have done. Most of the times I don't see people asking that question, who, who am I presenting it to? It kind of feels like, oh, I have done all these analysis, so I have all the information I need to put together. That's totally uh, opposite approach of what we should yeah. be doing. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so another thing you talk about is um, building teams and how, how it's important to have good teams. What are some methods that you've seen in the past of, of building good teams and how does data influence that or does it relate to that at all? Um, data relates to that, um, but uh, one thing I would say is m for many people, when we talk about building data teams, it seems to be uh, very uh, technical heavy. Like when we hire for positions, it seems like most of the times the core focus resides on the skills they have, like the technical skills, what are the tools, uh, whatever the tool is, like whether they know the proficiency of those tools, whether it's SQL or whatever it is, Python, SQL, and all those things. Um, I think that is definitely needed. I'm not going to say that that is not critical for a role like that. But when you're building a team together, the consolidated effort of the team should be like, there should be definitely a strong uh, leadership because then only the value of data gets promoted across cross-functionally, right? If there is not a data leader, what are you doing that is not that it's not getting communicated across the organization to begin with? But regardless of the technical skills, there are also other skills needed for this team to succeed, like whether it's a domain experience, because if you understand everything technically, but you don't understand the domain you're working on, there is a problem there. Um, and business knowledge and also soft skills, whether it's collaboration, communication, problem solving, um, and also adaptability, because we will, we all will agree that data changes and the tools and the way of doing things change very rapidly. I mean, cloud was not a thing like several years ago, but then yeah. m many people are moving away from on-prem, and that was not the case even if you take a couple of years ago, right? So it is very important to be adaptive of whatever comes your way. Um, presentation skills, as we uh, already talked, and persuasion and curiosity, because if you're not able to persuade what you are trying to say with your data, um, it's people don't absorb the information and also assuming sometimes that, okay, this is how I understand. So everybody will understand data the same way. That's mm -hmm. never the case. It's always better to start your meetings or whatever discussions you have to make sure both the parties are on the on the same side or understand it the same way, which many times people are surprised that that's not the case. So those, all the skills, so as a team, there they should be, maybe one person is more um, is tech savvy, they're more stronger, but when you put a team together, all these things should be uh, taken as a consolidated thing, right? Like it should all belong in that team. You cannot have a team of everybody who is just technically very advanced when they cannot present data, then they cannot persuade with it, or they're not adaptive, or they're not very creative. So all these skills have to be taken into consideration to build a really A-grade kind of a team perform performing team. Yeah, it sounds like you're talking about like building a diverse team. So how important is diversity when it comes to that, that team building? Uh, in my opinion, it's extremely important because we all see the solutioning aspect very differently, right? If the more diverse your team is, you will kind of see like various ways of solving it. Otherwise, you'll always look at one way of solving it. And also not just solutioning, solutioning is one aspect, but also understanding and interpreting of the problem itself will be very uh, different, unique for each person. 
So that is, in my opinion, diversity is extremely important in team building. Yeah, I remember um, um, I was I was building my really the first team that I managed, and you know we had kind of a wide variety of different ages on the team and different backgrounds. Um, some people from America, some people from other countries, some people with you know. Um, uh, young and old, male, female, and, you know, did just a wide variety of different people. And I, re- I remember in a meeting one time and one of the ladies on the team was, was a little bit older than a lot of the other people on the team. And she had this insight of like how the tool that we were building, we thought it was so simple to use and easy. And she's like, well, it's complicated because I would never look there for the button. I would look here, you know, and, yeah. you know, thinking about seeing that from a different perspective. And then, uh, then another person chimes in and says, yeah, in my culture, you know, that, that word is, is not, you know, even translated doesn't, doesn't give me that a good feeling. Like it's kind of like a negative tone in in my culture. Mm -hmm. So just having these different insights helped us build like a much better product than we could have built if we had just one way of thinking. Yeah, totally. That is, uh, that's exactly how I have seen it too, because even sometimes when you build a product and you. If you ask a bunch of technical folks, the answer would be, oh, yeah, it's very simple. It's very usable. You get get it through a usability test kind of a thing, mm-hmm. and you really watch how people are using it, if they use ability test. It's totally different. You'll be surprised, like, oh, this can be done like this. And that happens many times. So that is why the diverse personalities are very critical. And people sometimes even come in from a different industry, bring a totally different point of view, which somebody who is working in a specific industry for a long time may not see it that way. So all those things are very valid and important. Yeah, absolutely. And I've seen that, you know, through acquisitions as you like acquire certain companies that may be in a different industry than where you are. You can't just go and apply your own standards and your own policies and procedures of doing things to their industry until you really learn it and see what fits and what doesn't fit. Um, you know, because it's not always one shoe fits all, you know. Yeah, totally. Um, so when it, when it comes to you know data, team building, and putting all this stuff together, um, w- what is your view on transparency of that information that that is collected uh, when it comes to within the company and things like that? And, and how do you communicate properly uh, with your team that you're building uh, using information? What are some ways that we can creatively use that information? Um. That is where I would say uh, the data culture part of the organization comes into play, right? Because how information is shared, I mean, if it's a much bigger organization, maybe there are town halls, there are like, you know, individual department meetings and so on. But it's an overkill if it is much smaller, one location kind of a company. So the answer is obviously it depends on the culture of the organization because the culture plays like uh, normally how do you communicate these changes um whether there are workshops to really i mean some companies would say okay there is like where they're very large so they have to bring like team members together who would be working together with all these uh, data points which we have collected to improve the operational efficiency of the org uh and then they let's have a workshop to really uh like go to the granular level of like how this all will fit in together but if you're a very small shop that level would not be needed. Maybe one meeting to really review everything that was done is enough. So the answer is totally depends on the culture of the company. Right. So uh, do you have any advice for people trying to define that culture? Because, you know, in some orgs, you know, data science is is kind of a newer field. And um, uh, so how how would you work on, like, figuring out what that is? Um. I would say uh, to define, I mean, a- anybody will uh, accept, like my, I mean, right now, how technology has improved and many tools are trying to offer us a lot more capabilities. Yeah, it's totally understood that one tool may do one thing better than the other. But when you consider tools, in general, many tools are advancing at a rapid pace. Yeah. So it's like one of the things I would say is to change, like the technology, I mean, as long as you have the money to invest um, investment ready for doing it and the time to do it it can be done but culture is something it's much more difficult to build it doesn't it doesn't happen overnight right it's a conscious persistent effort which has to happen little by little and maybe you should celebrate the little um, winnings along the way but culture is something 
tough to build. So it it goes back to the kind of people uh, we hire, the kind of um, programs we have for them to really shape into those laws, like le- leadership programs, for mm-hmm. right? So all those things make um, are of importance, but that is what I would like to say, like uh, how to build the culture is... Um, every small step. It's not just like a mission statement on a wall, right? It is more <laughs> like everything that we do and also how we hire and how we, once they are in those roles, do we really um, kind of monitor that, that the culture is what, how we think is what is happening and also to train them before they go into different roles, how do we train them so that they kind of represent the company and the teams in their teams correctly. Yeah, for sure. Um, tell me a little bit about your uh, your book, Thriving in a Data World, and why you put this together. Um, this book um, has been something I wanted to do for a while. Uh, the reason why I did it was I mentored several people along the way in my career, uh, a lot of junior staff, mid-level, people trying to get into like more managerial kind of roles. Um, And also somebody who is coming from a different industry and transitioning into data uh, field. So having mentored several people, I kind of see the struggles people normally face when it comes to um, entering data field or also like taking a role, which is more of a managerial uh, role. Uh, So I kind of felt like I have a lot of information I could share, which could be of value to people who are in the same boat. Um, so that is my real passion to write this book. Um, and I'm very happy I could devote the time to write. Writing a book is a lot of involvement of lot. I mean, you learn a lot in the process too. <laughs> so, um, it was a really fun experience for me as well. So that is one of the reasons I wrote the book to help out people who are looking for that kind of advice in one place. So it is not a technical book. Uh, it is very technical a technology agnostic, I would say, but it will talk about pretty much many topics which we covered, whether it's ROI, data literacy, uh, data storytelling, uh, what are the things you need to build a good team and why data projects fail because it's not, I mean, there are a lot of reasons why data projects fail, so that book covers those aspects as well. So that is the gist of what is in the book. Awesome. And uh, where can people like connect with you online if they have more questions about this stuff? And where can they find a copy of the book? Um, the copy of the book you can find in Amazon, both like either it's a print version or an ebook. And also I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Uh, so if you want to connect with me, LinkedIn is one option. I do have a website, which is my first name, last name dot com, singitakrishnan.com. So that is another option for you to connect. Awesome. And I'll link that up in the show notes too at geekleader.com so you can find it there. Uh, Sangeeta, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, John. If you enjoyed that episode, please uh, leave a rating and review in Apple Podcasts. I'd greatly appreciate that. And also don't forget to check out merch. We have some t-shirts that uh, I've designed that are on at geekleader.com. Um, You can click on the merchandise uh, section there and check that out. And also don't forget about the books from our guests. So if you like this guest and other guests that have written books, please um, go ahead and check that out at geekleader.com. I would greatly appreciate it, and I'm sure they would too.